Good morning. It's time for us to begin our worship service today. It's good to see all of you here with us. I hope you've all had a good weekend. And it's good to see you here with us today, starting the week off right with worship. Bulletins are in the foyer. Uh, your Bible study guide for the week is uh, inserted in the bulletin. Be sure and get one of those if you did not get one on your way in. A couple of updates to share with you uh, this morning. Pat Rowland has been struggling with uh, her voice for quite some time now. Uh, she received a diagnosis of lymphedema. This past week, she is going through therapy to correct that problem, so we are pleased with the diagnosis and are certainly prayerful that uh, that therapy will be successful. Uh, Debbie Fuller met with her radiologist this week. Uh, that meeting went well. She continues to recover from her uh, surgery. She does face both radiation and chemotherapy treatments in the near future, so we want to continue to remember her in our prayers. Lois Williams uh, is uh, having a uh, heart monitor to evaluate her heart. That gets to come off tomorrow and then she will be meeting with uh, her doctors to see uh, what has caused the uh, heart fluctuation that she's been dealing with for the last week or so. I want to continue to be prayerful about that. A friend of the Taylors, Elaine Gerard, recently had a baby and uh, this past week she had to have an appendectomy so that went well i want to remember her in our prayers as well as jamie Rowland's mother nancy clark she has an aortic blockage and faces some tests this week on how to deal with that those are all of the updates to the prayer request list that we have is there anything that i was not made aware of before the start of service that we need to mention You'll see this in the bulletin, but I feel that it is uh, noteworthy. Sarah Cook will be graduating this Friday from Tennessee Tech with a Bachelor's of Science degree in nursing. She is uh, a registered nurse, and following graduation, uh, she is going to be moving back here and working at Stonecrest Medical in the labor and delivery <coughs> department. So we celebrate with Sarah uh, and her accomplishments and celebrate with her family as well. If there are no other announcements, I will turn the service over to Clay, who will be leading our singing today. Our first song this morning will be 891. 891, we'll sing through twice. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord hath made, the Lord hath made. Yeah. 
we're in our minds to protect these emblems this morning. Let us read our minds of all the, the thoughts of this world and focus solely on the sacrifice that was given for us. Pray with me as we give thanks for the bread. Most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day and for all that you bless us with. Father, we thank you for, for Jesus. We thank you for sacrifice. Father, we thank you for forgiveness. Father, we partake of this bread. We ask that you help us to remember the sacrifice that was given for us, to remember the body on the cross. Father, as often as we do this, let us do so in manner that's pleasing to thy sight. In Christ's name, amen. truly are a blessed group of people, a blessed nation. Father, as we give back a portion of what we've been so richly blessed with, Father, we pray that we'll do so with a, with a glad and, and cheerful heart. Christ, amen. amen. Our next song this morning will be 220. 220. I serve a risen Savior, He's in the world today. Oh. 
Uh, from that standpoint, uh, you cannot say that one is greater than the other because neither one can we do. And again, just like sin, we tend to categorize sin based on the consequences, the worst consequence, the worst sin. And in the same token, we do the same thing with miracles as well. The more impressive the miracle, the greater we think it might be. And, and so certainly from a sensational standpoint, we might argue that raising someone up from the dead is more sensational than changing water to wine. Uh, so I don't want to minimize it in any way, but in terms of the sensational sense of it, uh, Paul is going to recall one of the greatest miracles of the Bible. And from a sensational sense again, I would say that the birth of Isaac would, would fall under that category. Uh, well, what makes this birth so special? Well, first of all, Abraham was 100 years old when Isaac was born. His mother was 90 when he was born. Now, if you go to the Guinness Book of World Records, you're going to see a number of extremely trivial world records that are in that particular book. But one of the things that is in that book is the oldest person to ever give birth. And that award goes to Ruth Alice Kistler. And at the young age of 57 years old, she gave birth to a child. Now, there is one report it is not well verified by any stretch of the imagination, but there is one report that in 1776, Ellen Ellis, at the age of 72, gave birth to a child. But in terms of verifiable data, uh, Ruth Alice Kistler uh, has that uh, distinction at the age of 57. Now, here's the point that I want us to understand from all of that. Both of these individuals look like teenagers in comparison to Sarah. All through this chapter, <clears throat> Romans 4, Paul has been appealing to the faith of Abraham to prove his point that men are saved by faith in Jesus Christ. Now, today, as we conclude chapter 4, we are going to see what kind of faith it was that Abraham had. What was the nature of this saving faith that Abraham had? It was simply faith in what God said. That's what it boils down to. It came down to faith in what God said. There are lessons that we can learn from this story this morning. And so as we finish the fourth chapter of Romans, I want us to spend some time talking about Geritol diapers and the Word of God. Our text from Romans 4, verse 18 and following. In hope against hope he believed, so that he might become a father of many nations, according to that which he had been spoken, so shall your descendants be. Without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body, now as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. Yet with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in the faith, giving glory to God, and being fully assured that what God had promised, he himself was also able to perform. Therefore, it was also credited to him as righteousness. Not, now, not for his sake only was it written that it was credited to him, but for our sake also, to whom it will be credited, as those who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He who was delivered over because of our transgressions and was raised because of our justification. So, this morning... Uh, the first thing that we need to understand is that Abraham's faith was well placed. Uh, consider how Abraham's faith was placed as it relates to the direction of his faith. Now, verse 20 tells us that he did not waver. That's the New American Standard Version. Now, the New King, or excuse me, the Old King James Version translates it this way: staggered not at the promise of God. New American Standard wavered not at the promise of God. Uh, King James Version staggered not at the promise of God. And here I actually like the King James Version better. I like the King James Version better. It is not as literal. The wavered not is a more literal translation, but I like the King James Version uh, better here. And I'll tell you why. Uh, first of all, it is possible for us to physically stagger or stumble. It is also possible for us to stagger or stumble mentally and spiritually as well. And I like the image that the King James Version translators are painting for us here. 
because it really, I think, brings home the point of what happens when our faith fails, when we give in to doubts. I think that it is stronger, and I think it paints a better picture. Yes, it is a less literal picture, but I do think that the translators, the King James translators here, did an excellent job of trying to convey the point that Paul wants us to understand. And that is that when our faith fails, when we doubt, it is not a mere wavering. It is not a, should I get honey mustard or barbecue for my chicken McNuggets, okay? It's not an indecision type of thing. More literal translation waver, yes, but I don't think it paints the right picture for us. When our faith wavers, when we are doubting, yes, it is a staggering, it is a stumbling, it is a significant event in the life of the individual from a spiritual standpoint. And this is why I think that it is always good for the serious Bible student to have more than one translation. You don't have to be able to read Greek to be able to fully appreciate the point. If I just sat down with the New American Standard and the King James and read verse 20, I am going to have a pretty full understanding of what Paul is trying to convey, right? When I understand, wait, well, what does it mean to waver? Well, when I go to the King James Version, I understand. It means to stagger not. My, my faith has not staggered. It has not stumbled. And then vice versa. What is Paul trying to convey in terms of a faith staggering? Oh, I'm, I'm wavering. I'm doubting. And, and so both of these together do an excellent job of trying to convey the message that Paul wants us to convey. But in this instance, while less literal, I think the King James Version does a better job of really painting the picture that Paul is trying to convey here. Uh, and it simply means that he stuck to his guns. He believed without reservation in God's ability to keep his word. God's ability to keep his promise. Well, what was that promise? To answer that, all we have to do is look at Genesis chapter 12, Genesis chapter 15, and Genesis chapter 21. The Lord had promised to make Abraham great, to make a great nation out of him, and yes, in terms of our text for the morning specifically, to give him a son. And when these verses that are listed in your lesson handout are taken as a whole, they teach an incredible truth about God and how he supernaturally caused Abraham and Sarah to have a son named Isaac. Basically, Abraham directed his faith towards God, even when it seemed that that promise was completely, totally, and utterly impossible. And here's the bottom line. It all boils down to whether or not you want to believe God. That's what it boiled down for Abraham. That's what it boils down for you and me as well. Whether it is salvation or any area of our life, the results of our faith will always be determined by the direction of our faith. Faith that is placed in God is a faith that will always be rewarded. And so we see the direction of His faith. It was directed towards God. We see the duration of His faith. When the promise was first given to Abraham, he was 75 years old. Even then, it must have seemed like an impossibility. The last time the promise was given was in Genesis 17. At this point, Abraham was 99 years old, and it must have really seemed like an impossibility. Yet Abraham's faith never staggered. It never wavered. The Bible tells us that Abraham believed God, and the verb tense here suggests that he believed God when he first received the promise and he never stopped believing in God. Every step along the way, he continued to believe God. Every day, every step, it never stopped. It never staggered. It never wavered. He kept on believing until the promise was fulfilled. That is the kind of faith that sees mountains move. And so this morning, I encourage some of you who have been waiting on the Lord to move in your life. He hasn't forgotten about you. 
If He has made a promise, you can count on Him to bring it to fulfillment in your life, in His time. So we do not give up, we do not despair, but we do trust in the Lord and He will bring it to pass. Abraham's faith was directed towards the Lord. The duration of his faith, it never ceased. And the determination of his faith. There are three truths revealed about the faith of Abraham that serve as an encouragement to you and me this morning and how we must live our lives in dependence upon the Lord. And the first thing that we see is that he refused to listen to reason. Now, please do not misunderstand what I'm saying here. I am not saying that faith is anti-reason. That is not what I am suggesting. Abraham, verse 18, hoped against hope. Abraham had his eyes on something that was bigger than his circumstances. If his eyes were on his circumstances, he had every reason to doubt. His faith had every reason to stagger. But he refused to listen to what he knew by reason because of what he knew by faith. If it were any of us, we would say things like, I'm too old or you're too old. We would say things like, you and Sarah are shriveled up like a prune. We've tried many times before, why would it work now? It's a physical impossibility, but apparently Abraham refused to dwell in the negative. God had given him a promise. Yes, he knew all the reasons why it wouldn't work. But he also believed in a God whom he knew did work. What a lesson for you and for me. Faith is not anti-reason. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Evidence is not anti-reason. Abraham's faith was just superior to and superseded man's reason. Another thing that he did was refuse to look at reality. He refused to look at his situation because his eyes were on God. Could you imagine what this old couple did as they prepared for the fulfillment of the promise of God? Dr. Ray Pritchard gives this possible chronology of Abraham and Sarah's 25-year wait for a son. Updated for 2021, yes, but if you'll follow the point. At age 76, they buy a crib. At 78, they make a list of possible boys' names. At 80, they order a supply of super-absorbent pampers. At 85, Abraham goes hunting while Sarah's friends give her a baby shower. At age 86, they put up wallpaper in the baby's room. At 90, they subscribe to New Parent Magazine. At 93, he and Sarah start Lamaze classes. At 96, Abraham drives a practice run to the hospital. At 98, they pack a suitcase and set it by the tent door. And at 99, Abraham scratches his head and wonders, is God just kidding me here? Let me ask a question that is probably going to make us a little uncomfortable. Did Abraham doubt? I'm going to suggest to you that he did. I'm going to suggest to you that he did. And I have a couple of reasons to support that idea. Number one, Abraham was human. One of the things that we sometimes fail to remember is that even though we read these people in two dimension on, on a piece of paper and, and on black ink on white paper, these were not two dimensional people. They were real live people, just like you and me. Okay, they didn't have cell phones and airplanes. They were less technologically advanced. I get it. But they were real live people with real live lives and real live problems. So number one, yes, I think he doubted because it's only human. Number two, I think Scripture supports me just a little bit here because in Genesis 17, verse 17, we read that Abraham and Sarah laughed at the news that a baby would be born. You know why they laughed? It's absurd. That's why they laughed. Even with faith, it's absurd. Maybe they felt that the promise was more like a cruel joke that was being played out on these two people. Yes, I do believe that he doubted. And you want Abraham to have doubted. 
It might make you uncomfortable. It might have even triggered you a little bit. But you want Abraham to doubt. And here's why. You want Abraham to doubt because he doubted, but he acted in belief. That's faith. Faith means, yes, we might have doubts. It's part of that mind that the Lord gave us. But he didn't act in doubt. He acted in belief. Faith is not 100% certainty. Faith is belief mixed with unbelief, but it is action taken in belief. When we let our doubts win, that's not faith. When we let our faith win, when we trust in God in spite of our doubts and act on it, that is faith. Abraham was a man who believed. Did he doubt? Yes. I think that we can make a good case for that. But the story isn't about Abraham's doubts. The story isn't about Abraham's failure. And the reason is because Abraham didn't act in doubt. He acted in faith. And how is that faith revealed? His name was changed. When we first meet Abraham, his name was Abram, which meant exalted father. When he received the promise from God, his name changed to Abraham, which means father of a multitude. Now, why would his name be changed from exalted father, which is an honored enough name, to father of a multitude. I wonder if it might have something to do with what have we been talking about today? Yes, the promise of God. Abraham certainly had his doubts, but he didn't let them sidetrack him. He kept on for God and won the victory. Now, what does that say to us? Faith is a battle. Yes, faith is a struggle. Yes, there will be doubts. There will be time when we, times when we feel like giving up and giving in to those doubts. But real faith never gives up. It always rests in the knowledge that God will do exactly what He promised to do. Abraham's faith was determined because he refused to listen to reason, he refused to listen to the reality of the situation, and number three, he refused to lose his reward. Abraham lived for 25 years with the knowledge that one day God would give him and Sarah a child. He knew it and he refused to let go of that truth. He obtained the promise and was declared righteous by God because he responded to God's promise with an attitude of faith. I don't know what you need from the Lord this morning, but if you have His promise in the matter, then I challenge you to act in faith today. Learn what faith is. As we've already mentioned, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And verse 2 of this chapter, which doesn't get near as much playtime in the pulpit as verse 1, says, by it the men of old gain approval. And then the Hebrew writer goes on to list, list a number of different names, but no name gets listed any more than Abraham. We know when the author wrote verse 2 that Abraham was foremost in his mind. We need to learn not only what faith is, but that nothing else pleases the Lord. In verse 6 of Hebrews 11, we read that without faith, it is impossible to please Him. For he who comes to God must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of those who seek Him. We need to learn that anything less is sin. In Romans chapter 14, Paul is speaking to a specific situation, but he says this, He who doubts is condemned if he eats, because he is eating not from faith, but whatever is not from faith is sin. When we act on doubts, we sin. When we act in faith, we do well, and we are rewarded. <coughs> Abraham's faith was not only well placed, but Abraham's faith was well pleased. It was first of all well pleased with God's promise. His faith was pleased with the promises of God because he knew that they were from God. It was he who made them. What I see here is a man who did not look for reasons to doubt. He did not look for reasons to doubt. He simply took the Lord at his word, praised God for the answer to the prayer, though it was not yet visible. This is the faith that pleases God. And all that I can say to you this morning is trust the Lord. He is as good as His Word. There was a time when a man's Word was his bond. That day is still here as it relates to the Lord our God. If He said it, He will do it. And so Abraham was pleased with the promise of God. He was pleased with the performance of God. He knew what God had promised to do, and he knew that God was able to do it. 
He did not look at the problem in one hand and downsize God with the other. He simply took the Lord at His word and knew that if God said it, that God would see to it. That is why Abraham could take his now teenage son to Mount Moriah and offer him as a burnt offering before the Lord. Because Abraham knew that if God could give him a son, raising that son from the dead was no problem. We began today's lesson by talking about one of the greatest miracles in the Bible. Abraham knew if God could do that, this over here is no problem. And the Hebrew writer verifies this. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was offering up his only begotten son. It was he to whom it was said, in Isaac your descendants shall be called. He considered that God is able to raise men even from the dead, from which he also received him back as a tithe. Abraham's faith knew that if God could do one, the second was no problem. And again, I'm telling you this morning that you can count on God. He is still able to move in power as He always has been. He is still God this morning. And so Paul would tell the Ephesian church, now to Him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, beyond all that we can ask or think, to Him be glory in the church. Here is God's testimony of Himself. In Genesis 18. Remember how Abraham and Sarah laughed? I equated that to doubting. Listen to what God had to say when he stood on the witness stand in order to defend himself. Is anything too difficult for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you. At this time next year, and Sarah will have a son. And so Abraham was pleased not only with the promise of God, but the performance of God, as well as the plan of God. Abraham's faith was well pleased with the Lord because the Lord took the faith of this old man and credited it to him as righteousness. Put another way, God saved the soul of Abraham because he took God at his word. God's plan for Abraham is still God's plan for you and me this morning as we see in the truth that Abraham's faith has been well preserved. It was, has been preserved with a promise. We are told that the promise was not just to impute the righteousness of Abraham, but also for everyone who exercised faith. Not just any faith, but saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember how we just read in Hebrews 11 verse 19 that Abraham offered, uh, offered Isaac as a sacrifice, but that Abraham received his son back as a type? So we see in Isaac a type, and that type is the Lord Jesus. And so, Abraham was saved because of his faith in the promise of God as it relates to Isaac. Jesus is a type, or excuse me, Isaac is a type of that. And so just as Abraham believed in the promises of God as it related to Isaac, and it was imputed to him as righteousness, when we believe in the promise of God as it relates to Jesus Christ, then we are imputed with God's righteousness. Abraham acted on the light that he had received and was declared righteous by God. He was saved by faith. However, the object of our saving faith is different than that of Abraham. Abraham was saved because he believed in the promise of God as it related to Isaac. You and I are saved when we believe in the promise of God as it relates to Jesus. Specifically, the promise found in Mark 16, 16. He who believes, remember Abraham believed God, and it was imputed to him as righteousness. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Yes, we are saved when we believe and, like Abraham, act on the promises of God. For us to be saved, we must react to the light that we have been given, just as Abraham reacted to the light that he had been given. In Acts 4, verse 12, we read that there is salvation in no one else, and that there is no name given under heaven by which we must be saved. When the Philippian jailer asked what he must do to be saved, 
They were told in Acts 16, believe in the Lord and you shall be saved, you and your household. Jesus in John 14 said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Your faith is in something this morning. Is it in Jesus or is it in something else? And so Abraham's faith has been preserved in the form of a promise. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. And it is also saved or preserved rather as a person. The promise boils down to one man, Jesus Christ. He is the central focus of every promise of God that has ever been given. He is the one whom all the nations of the world will be blessed. He is the one who died on the cross and rose from the dead. He is the one who paid our sin debt when He rose from the dead. And He is the one who sits at the right hand of God making intercession for you and me. If He is not, then that faith is dead. But He isn't. Our faith stands on two great pillars. The first one being the fact that Jesus died for our sins and the second that He arose from the dead. Later in Romans chapter 10, Paul would say this, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believes resulting in righteousness and with the mouth he confesses resulting in salvation. To the Corinthian church, Paul would say, for I delivered to you as of first importance that which I received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried and that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. And if you believe this, and if you act on the promises of God, just like with Abraham, you will be blessed. Just like Abraham, you will be saved. You will be declared righteous. And so we conclude with the words of James. Abraham believed God. And it was imputed to him, counted to him, as righteousness. Paul's conclusion in this section of Scripture makes it clear that nothing else, no one else, will work. Salvation comes through saving faith in Jesus Christ. Abraham believed and it was saved. And was saved. It wasn't works, it wasn't law, it wasn't circumcision. It was faith then and it is faith now. Therefore, where is your faith? If you have never placed your faith in Jesus, then this morning I encourage you to repent of your sins, confess Jesus as the Christ, believe in the promises of God, and have your sins washed away through baptism. If as a Christian, your faith has been misplaced, then we'd be happy to pray with you, and we would be happy to pray for you. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation today, Jesus invites you, and we stand and sing to encourage you. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, seeking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. From the waters lifted me, now safe and high. Love lifted
523 in the Psalm book. 523. We'll see the first and fourth verse. <coughs> It's good to see everyone this morning. Hope you all have a good week. Hope to see you all again here Wednesday night. After this, we'll have our closing prayer. There is beyond the azure blue a God concealed from human sight. He tends his God's heavenly hue and framed the worlds with